Uh, welcome to the uh, Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. My name is Paul Wormser, and I'm the acting director of the library. Uh, I appreciate all of you coming to one of our continuing um, author talk presentations. Um, today, we are very fortunate to have the re really the leading scholar on Pat Nixon, who was, by the way, born 100 years ago um, this year. Mary Brennan, who did much of our research here for, for her book, um, is the chair of the Department of History at the University of Texas in San Marcos. She, excuse me. Um, her, her specialty is um, post-World War II conservative movements, and she has written to date three different books, um, those being Turning Right at the 60s, The Conservative <coughs> Capture of the GOP, Wives, Mothers, and the Red Menace, Conservative Women and the Crusade Against Communism, and of course the book that we love most around here, which is Pat Nixon, Embattled First Lady. Um, the, her book is an outstanding work, and I look um, forward to uh, welcoming, or I would like you to help me welcome her out onto the stage to talk about her work. Mary Brennan. Thank you, Paul. It is such a great honor to be back here at the Nixon Library. As Paul said, I did much of my research here, and I feel very close to all of the people here. They were so helpful to me in learning what I did about Pat. I would like to begin with a story. One evening in 1954, as the Nixons exited a dinner at which President Eisenhower was going to speak, they came across an Indian woman sitting on a bench outside the banquet hall. Pat thought she recognized the woman and asked if Dick did. When he said no, they continued down the stairs. Halfway down, Pat remembered the woman and made her husband return to where the woman was sitting. Pat spoke with the woman and asked her if they had not met previously. When the woman replied that they had, Pat asked about her stay in the US and inquired what she was doing in the hallway. The woman explained that she was returning to India in a few days and hoped to catch a glimpse of the president before she went home. Pat then arranged for the woman to be given a seat at the dinner so that she could hear the speech as well as see the president. The Nixons then left the hall to continue on to their previous engagement. I use this story to begin my talk because I think it exemplifies several key points I wish to make about Pat Nixon and her public role more particularly about her role as foreign diplomat. First, Pat met the Indian woman during one of her travels as second lady. For Pat, the traveling she did as first and second lady was the best part of her job as a political wife. Second, this woman was not the wife of an ambassador or a statesman. She was just a young woman who had come to the United States, who had come out first to see the second lady, and then had come to the United States to study. Pat didn't limit her contacts on her travels to important people. She treated everyone she met as though they were the most important person in the world. The people she met sensed her sincerity and responded to it. Third, she was happiest in her role when she could take action. The party the Nixons were at and the engagement they were going to were not as important at that moment as getting this visitor from India a seat at the presidential dinner. In the greater scheme of things, this is a rel really a small act, but it left a lasting impression both on the woman involved, the Indian woman involved, and on the women in, at the table that she was eventually seated at. That's how we actually know about the event, is through a letter that someone who she ended up sitting, sitting with responded and, and wrote to Pat later about it. For Pat, politics was her job, and one she didn't always enjoy. While on occasion she was proud of her work and helping to raise funds for the party, she found many of her tasks frustrating and mind-numbing. By the end of the first term, she expressed her jealousy of her friend's re-entry into the workforce. She wrote, I would like to do part-time work rather than all the useless gadding about I am expected to do. The thrill of meeting famous men and women and the glamour of white tie dinners at the White House wore off leaving only the tiring routine of constant evenings away from her girls and idle chatter with women she did not always like. 
For someone who had worked hard her entire life, and she had worked hard her entire life, the situation could at times be intolerable. It was not the long hours or the physical challenges that weighed her down. She resented not being useful, not doing something meaningful. Perhaps that is why foreign travel appealed to her. During her trips overseas, she felt that she was playing an important role. She was representing American interest abroad. Her introduction to role as American representative came during her first year as second lady, when President Eisenhower sent his vice president on a tour beginning in Asia and continuing to parts of the subcontinent during the fall of 1953. President Eisenhower told the vice president that he should take Pat with him. Now, she realized that this trip was going to be work, but it was going to be interesting. Pat described the pending trip in almost exactly the same words in a letter that she wrote to her good friend, Helene Drown, next month. Along with a minimal entourage that included a military aide, a State Department representative, a flight surgeon, three press representatives, two Secret Service agents, Nixon's administrative assistant, Christian Herter Jr., and the only other woman on the trip, Rosemary Woods, the Nixons embarked on their 42,000-mile journey. In a little more than two months, the group visited over 15 countries, attended hundreds of state dinners, participated in innumerable ceremonies, and spoke with millions of people. The State Department had briefed the group on the many countries and peoples they would be visiting. Pat took these briefings very much to heart. In fact, one member of the group told a reporter a few years later that Pat had served as the group's walking encyclopedia. Whenever they needed information about what country they were in or the culture, they would always turn to her because she would have the information. Her husband concentrated on the larger mission of reassuring American allies, Asian allies and friends, clarifying Eisenhower's policies and assessing attitudes toward communism. While he did that, Pat's role was to go out and meet the people. Neither he nor Pat had ever been particularly interested in formal socializing, so he requested that official dinners be kept to a minimum so that they could meet with as many different people as possible in the countries they visited. Pat recognized that there was a job to be done, as she wrote in her travel diary, but she could not help but be caught up in the thrill of traveling. Even her sadness at leaving the girls did not completely overwhelm her excitement. The harsh reality of such extensive travel combined with the little girl's enthusiasm for seeing new and different sights leaps off the pages of her diary. She gleefully recorded her initiation ceremony as she crossed the equator for the first time. Quote, Dick acted as King Neptune and wore the crown as designed by the crew. What fun! She admitted attendance at a female frolic where the hostess arranged to have all male entertainment. Quite risque. On the 14th of October, she detailed their experience in a Maori village in New Zealand where Dick had to take part in a ritual dialogue and actions with the native century. Both she and Dick then had to participate in the custom of nose rubbing. Although she said that she felt faint when some of the disheveled oldsters lined up for a session of nose rubbing, the Nixons wanted to be good sports, so we took it. She actually had more problems because she also visited the kitchen where the women were, were cooking the, the food that they were going to be eating later on. And she said that the kitchen was so dirty and unsanitary that she was actually really quite leery of eating the food that was given to them. And she kind of had learned the art of pushing food around on her plate and kind of covering things up. So it looked like she was eating without actually having to eat anything. This would, be the, this would prove to be the case on all the overseas trips the Nixons would make during the vice presidential years. Although their schedules were often crowded with official duties and the conditions could be challenging, Pat continued to be thrilled at visiting new countries. In early 1956, she and Dick attended the inauguration of the new Brazilian president in Rio de Janeiro, a city that she called the most spectacularly beautiful city she had ever seen and where the parties at the palace were fabulous. But she did find the client change quite, um, required quite a terrific adjustment. They actually went in January. So there was something like a 75 degree climate change when they went in one day. In July of that year, the Nixon set off on another whirlwind tour. She explained in a letter to Helene that this was a fast and, fury, fast and full trip. In the course of one day, we were in three countries, Thailand, Pakistan, and Turkey. 
Although her husband met with government leaders, 